All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sheryl Crone, and on behalf of the Hunt Institute, we thank you for attending today's webinar on a very relevant topic as we enter a new year, yet remain in a global pandemic. We are excited today to partner with Data Quality Campaign for the first in a two-part series on evaluating student learning during COVID-19, vital insights using skip year growth. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will have the Q&A feature open to ask panelists questions throughout the hour. We will try to get to as many questions today as we possibly can. And we are also gonna be posting a link to a companion document that provides more information on skip year growth through the chat feature and in email. Now, I am excited to welcome our wonderful partner in this effort, Jennifer Bell Elwinger, President and CEO of Data Quality Campaign for our opening remarks. Hi, good afternoon and thank you, Cheryl, for that warm introduction. And I'm so uh, thankful to be able to kick off an important webinar that we're having talking about skip your growth with um, a, just a terrific panel this afternoon. But before we jump in, I just wanted to share a little bit about um, uh, the data quality campaign, who we are, and we are a nonpartisan national advocacy organization focused on education data use and policy. And that is why this discussion today is so important to, to us and how strongly we believe in academic growth data. And so, you know, really growth data allows us, and you'll hear from our panelists today, growth data really allows people to truly see the progress that students are hopefully making each year. And just to reflect a little bit, when I was in the Baltimore City Schools and doing this work, I led the district's effort to really go below, go underneath uh, just the proficiency information to really understand what growth look like and to see that progress. And that really, you know, teachers and educators really started to understand that students were indeed making progress each year. And so, you know, now, you know, now you think about it more than ever, really, people do truly need this information. And this skip year growth concept that we're going to be talking about in a minute will allow states to understand student academic growth during these very challenging times. And being able to measure growth in 2021 starts, of course, with administering state assessments. And I, I think our panel will address that also. So thank you all for joining us today. And I want to just extend my, my gratitude to the Hunt Institute for their partnership on such an important issue. And again, as Cheryl mentioned, this is the first of two um, two webinars where we'll be talking about skip your growth. But now to kind of talk about what is skip your growth, we're gonna to turn to our colleague, Ali Ball, who's a senior associate at the Data Quality Campaign to walk us through that. So, all right, Ali, all to you. Jen, um, let me just get my screen going. All right. So um, before turning to our panel, as Jen said, we wanted to provide a brief overview on the value of growth measures and some details on skip year growth specifically. Student growth measures use multiple years of student data to capture changes in student learning over time. This provides a richer picture of student progress than moment in time proficiency measures alone. It's also valuable to different people in different ways. Parents and teachers can use growth data to see how individual students are progressing and what they need to achieve their goals, particularly for students who may not meet proficiency benchmarks, but who are still improving. School and district leaders can also use growth data to see, explore the impact of individual educators on their students' learning and identify those that are going above and beyond to help their students uh, grow. Finally, policymakers and advocates can use disaggregated growth data to ensure that schools are supporting all of their students' learning. Typically, growth is measured with using a year-to-year -year approach, which uses assessment data from the year prior with the current school year. In the absence of prior year assessment data, however, it is still possible to measure student growth using a approach called skip year growth, which uses data from two years prior and the current year. In this way, skip year growth measures capture student progress over the past two academic years combined. Um, skip year growth can be measured using different types of growth models and can also still be disaggregated by student group. Um, moreover, skip year growth data still provides the same critical insights into school quality and student learning as year to year growth. 
While it may not be business as usual, Skip Your Growth is indeed a tried and tested solution when year-to-year -year growth is not an option. States including Massachusetts and Tennessee routinely measure Skip Your Growth in the absence of prior year assessment data, such as following untested grades or after disruptions to statewide assessments. Although Skip Your Growth measures can and do produce valid and reliable growth data, there are some factors that may impact calculation for certain schools or student groups including student mobility, transition grades, available assessment data, and student group end size. States should work with their evaluation experts and assessment vendors to determine how they can effectively measure and use skip year growth in their specific context. And while they may not be able to use skip year growth data in all the ways they typically use year to year growth data, um, state leaders should still consider skip year growth data to be a valuable source of information on student performance, which can shed light on how students are progressing and the supports they need to achieve their goals. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Cheryl so we can start the panel. You know, thank you, Ali, for that. The great sort of information, I think that helps inform some of the panelists discussion that's happening today. And I'll remind everyone that again, there's a link in the chat feature to another companion document DQC also has a lot of information on their website about the topic as well, have done a lot of different resources available, so make sure you visit that as well. Um, and again, please put your questions in the Q&A feature. I've already answered one. We will make sure Ali's PowerPoint is sent out uh, after this webinar is over through email. So now I'm excited and delighted to turn it over to our moderator for the day, uh, Tamika Hart who is not only the Managing Director of Portfolio Strategy and Initiatives at Blue Meridian, but also serves as Board Chair at Data Quality Campaign. Tamika, welcome and over you to you to start today's discussion. All right, thank you, Cheryl. And I also wanna thank uh, Ali for that great information to kick us off. So I'm super honored and excited thanking both Hunt Institute and DQC for this wonderful conversation we're gonna to have today. And uh, as Cheryl pointed out, it's very timely and relevant. We all know what we are living through and have lived through and the impact it is having on our states and our education system. So I'm super excited about this panel. We have a panel of people who are indeed experts. They've researched, they've used, they've had to put into practice. They probably have gotten beaten up over, on over the use of skip uh, year date. And so they know what they're talking about and they're here to shed some light to us. And so uh, thanking them in advance for this conversation. I wanna do quick brief introductions and then we'll get right in. So first we have uh, Rob Curtin. He's the Associate Commissioner, the Center for District Support at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. We have Dr. Juan DeBrock, he's a Senior Associate at the Center for Assessment. And we have Marie Hutchton, Supervisor of Accountability Analytics at the Colorado Department of Education. So again, welcome you all. Rob, I'm gonna come to you first. Um, and so as we saw, Ali uh, pointed to two states, Tennessee and Massachusetts, you're sitting in Massachusetts, you have experience using the skip your data. We just wanna tell us briefly about the circumstances that led Massachusetts to do so and, and, and any other guidance you can give. Sure, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Hunt Institute and DQC for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure and certainly this is a topic that's been on the forefront of our minds as we've come into this school year and happy to uh, share a little bit of our experience. Um, I think as part of background, um, I think as many people know, Massachusetts is a student growth percentile state um, and we've been producing student growth percentiles for about a decade now. A um, little shout out to our friends in Colorado and, and Dr. Bean Bennett for um, helping us out there as we, as, as we started our journey um, again about 10 years ago. But the, the general theme that I want to highlight today is that we always try to start from a perspective of what can be done with data instead of, instead of starting from a place of impossibility. Um, I think I've seen what I would say is far too many instant reactions that very quickly come to the conclusion of no 2020 test data equals no 2021 growth data. Um, and this isn't simply isn't true um, or required. And, you know, this is, and, you know, our lived experience tells us this in Massachusetts. And, you know, frankly, I can't think of a more important time that we need to be able to produce this data um, and use what we have at our, at our fingertips to be able to produce data um, on what's happened during this pandemic. <clears throat> When I think about sort of the circumstances that led us to measuring skip year growth, 
Um, I want to be really clear that we did not start out thinking about Scipio growth from a place having anything to do with an accountability system or educator evaluation or anything um, of that sort. You know, when we go back 10 years or so, we truly wanted to make student growth information publicly available as a complement to our achievement results for as many districts, schools, and subgroups as possible. And I think if you start with that as the goal, um, as opposed to incorporation into any of the systems that I pre previously mentioned, it, it makes it easier to look for solutions instead of finding the barriers. Um, and because you really are talking about the dissemination of information as opposed to um, you know, some sort of punitive nature or what might be perceived as, as punitive use of the data. You know, at the department in Massachusetts, I'm sure about a lot of my colleagues throughout the country, we have a lot of people that are smarter than, than myself um, that can get into, and probably on this call too, that can really get into all the technical details related to the SGP model. But one of the beauties of the SGP model, in my opinion, is that it is relatively easy to explain at a high level. So we, when, when thinking back, you know, sort of 10 years ago, we thought about our high level explanation of SGPs, right? And that is very simply, how does a student achieve compared to a cohort of academic peers, right? And normally that cohort of, of academic peers is generated from the prior grade or the prior two grades, depending on how much history, historical data you use. But when we place that on top of a grade 10 scenario and skip grade nine and compare the achievement of a student in grade 10 to a cohort of academic peers based on seven, grade seven, eight data, right? We find that it still works. And it's one of the beauties of the, of the model is that it allows for very simply to think about how does somebody achieve on, a, on, a, on an assessment this year compared to how they've done comp uh, as compared to their academic peers on previous assessments. Um, and so, yes, there's a greater time between the tests and maybe some of the conclusions that need to be drawn have to be adjusted, but the basic premise is the same. And we shouldn't think about the fact that we missed a year of data as being a, um, as a barrier. Um, the high school experience for us has told us that we need to make adjustments, but it is very much in line with what we've done for the last 10 years around high school, and it can be done. You know, and when we think about you know, that as a little bit of the background, we feel like that we're positioned well in this is all, of course, is assuming that assessment happens this spring. Um, I don't think any of us know exactly what's going to happen this spring, but assuming that this happens this spring, we feel like we're well positioned to produce SGPs wherever we have the ability to do so. It's not going to be perfect. And I don't want it to come across to say, oh, there's nothing to see here. This is going to be perfect like we like any other year. Less kids are going to get growth information than have previously. You know, it's, it's commonplace for third graders not to have growth information in our state because they don't have, a, we don't have our MCAS data prior to third grade. Well, now third and fourth graders aren't going to be receiving for SGPs because there was no third grade data for them in 2020. But kind of coming back to where I started, um, we intend to look to where we can do something and not focus on where we can't. Um, and, you know, there's communication strategies that I'm sure we'll get into in this discussion um, and, and, and there are some technical considerations, but the big thing is, you know, our lived experience tells us this is a possibility um, and one that we, everyone sh that we believe that we need to strive to achieve and not think about necessarily, um, you know, what we can't do, but instead what we can do. Tamika? Thank, yeah, thank you, Rob. Thank you very much for, um, for sharing that experience. And so, Marie, Rob kind of hinted to it. Colorado is another state that has uh, great experience here. And so you've navigated these disruptions to assessments and, and have worked around uh, this issue. So just give, share, please, your experience and how you have approached it. And what are you planning to do uh, moving forward in this, in this moment if you have time? Thank you. Thank you. And, and as everyone has said, Dina, thank you so much for having me here this morning. This is uh, certainly a passion topic of mine these days. And so I appreciate the opportunity, um, you know, to, to have this discussion with sort of my colleagues across the nation as we're all challenged with the current circumstances and trying to figure out how to move forward. Um, and I think Colorado, you know, having done the growth model for, you know, also a very long time, <clears throat> I think we've um, encountered several occasions over the years that we have really had to learn how to be a little more flexible with the growth model and figure out sort of the limits of what it can do. Um, you know, we have transitioned assessment systems at least three or four times 
um, you know, in, in this past decade. <clears throat> And so um, every time we, we have one of these big disruptions, um, we are always looking to see, can we continue to do growth? Because in Colorado, I mean, this is why we started the growth model. Um, it is one of our primary sort of, you know, principles and beliefs that information about student progress gives you the best insight into the impact of, of schools and districts, and that it is worth having that information if at all possible. And so we are always kind of, um, looking to see how, what, what, what data can be gleaned from any situation. Um, and so we had not actually pre previously experienced um, skip year growth. We have, um, in, in our different transitions, we have had some times where the constructs underlying the assessments have limited our ability to calculate growth over time. And in, there have been other places where we have been able to you know, transition from an old assessment to a new assessment sort of seamlessly um, in a single year and continue to use growth. Um, this is the first time, as I said, that we will have sort of an entire missing year of data on the same assessment. So I think we, um, we have been doing a lot of brainstorming and we started last spring, pretty much the instant um, I found out that we weren't going to be testing for spring 2019. I was like, okay, what can we do? How can we um, you know, maintain growth and maintain some information about our students learning despite this massive disruption in our assessments. Um, and so I had gone to you know, Dr. Damien Bedebener and was like, what are my options? <laughs> like, let's, let's brainstorm what we can try to do and how we can potentially um, pre-investigate what could happen is what I will call it. Um, I don't think anyone can really anticipate what the results post pandemic are going to look like. I think we're just gonna have to sort of see how it goes and experience it as it comes. But we really we did want to sort of do a, a check of the concept of skip year growth. And so one of the first things we did was actually run historical skip year growth calculations. So, you know, 2017 to 2019, what would our data have looked like if we were skipping that 2018 year? And how consistent, you know, were those skip year growth results with our one year growth results? Because really, I mean, the real, one of the big questions is sort of, you know, can skip year growth be used in lieu of one year growth? And so, you know, we definitely, we did all of our investigations and we found that under normal circumstances, yes, they, the results are similar enough and particularly at the systems levels, you know, schools and districts provide very comparable um, evaluative judgments of the, how well the schools are doing teaching their students. And so for us, that was like the very important first step, you know, proving conceptually that skip year growth um, could work and could be, you know, again, used um, for potentially accountability or other sort of inferential purposes. Um, I think now we're all in the, the, the challenging spot of waiting to see what happens, you know, as Rob had said in 2020, um, 2021, this spring. <laughs> um, and, you know, are we going to give assessments? Um, if we do, how many students are going to participate? So that's actually one big, one of the biggest concerns in Colorado. Um, we have had a pretty significant parent opt-out movement for several years. And so one of the things that um, over time we have also had to really navigate is how can you do growth when only you know, 60, 70, 80% of your students are actually testing? And so there have been some cases where we've decided that the results are not representative enough of our overall student population. And so we've not been able to run growth, um, particularly in some of the high school levels. But um, you know, there have been other times where we really have found that, um, that, that you know, the federal requirement of 95% participation is too high. We actually can see fairly representative um, you know, populations that get sort of down into the mid to upper 80s and still feel comfortable with growth results that come out of our data. So again, one of the things that I certainly have been, you know, coming into all these conversations for this spring around is if we can get at least, you know, 80 to 85 percent of our students to test, I think there is the possibility that we can run growth and actually have um, usable data and be able to say something about you know, the impacts of the pandemic and how student learning has, um, you know, shifted or been disrupted or, you know, continued on. Um, I think the, the challenge, of course, is if we go sort of below that kind of a threshold for representativeness, 
Um, and then, you know, the advantages of the Colorado growth model, because I still call it the Colorado growth model, sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, the advantage is that it is normative and it is about comparison to your peers. And so, um, you know, if the entire population shifts, then that gives you a, it gives you a very different picture of what is going on and that might, you know, cause some problems. And so we're trying to be, again, very realistic and plan for every contingency that is going to happen and try to do the, the pre-work that is necessary so that, you know, if we go this pathway, okay, we can do that. If we go this pathway, okay, we're, we're prepared to do that as well. And just trying to um, stay really flexible and willing to work with the situation, which I will say is a little bit hard as like, you know, a hardcore data nerd. I'm like, but I want to know what's going on. And so this has been, um, you know, a, a really interesting opportunity to sort of push my thinking and again to provide um, consultative services like to my leadership and to our state around what are the possibilities and how do we you know, position ourselves to be able to respond to whatever happens in to hopefully the most um, useful and coherent fashion that we possibly can given the circumstances. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rob and Marie both, thank you both for sharing and uh, especially including that you're not trying to say that this is easy and that you have all the answers. And so Juan, I want to come to you now. I'm going to resist the urge to ask you to take that guitar off the wall and play us. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question, uh, but that is really cool. And I'm almost really want to hear you play that. But, you know, you've looked at multi-states. We've heard from Massachusetts, Colorado, you know, how have other states dealt with these similar challenges? And um, what can you share about what some are doing now? Um, and any information you have on that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, um, good afternoon. And thanks for having us. I think uh, what Rob and Marie were talking about is kind of the, the, the issue that everyone's dealing with that skip year might be understood from a perspective where there's gaps in information like moving from grade eight to grade 11. But those are with a series of very known variables that include progressions of standards and are really less than comprehensive below grade level issues. There are a couple of questions that have come up at the Q&A about what happens about kids that are coming in below grade. And I think that um, while growth gives us some insight into that to a degree, it doesn't really tell us very specifically what to do next in the classroom. I think that's the realm of other information. But um, the, as far as skip your growth, it's not really something that's been attacked in the past from a high stakes approach, given the consequences associated with the interpretations of growth. Um, if you think about when states reset their assessment systems, it has a kind of a domino effect for accountability that there has to be a little bit of a pause and people kind of reset their systems moving forward because there's often a concern about shifting from uh, one known set of information to another known set of information. Now for accountability, Growth is really intended to supplement proficiency and performance data when compared to the prior year's performance. So it really shouldn't, this year's growth shouldn't be really that correlated with last year's proficiency. When you're talking about skip year methodology, you have to start looking back at two years, which makes confirmations about that lack of relationship pretty difficult. Um, and this is, again, the, the relationship between the prior prior year's performance and this year's growth um, is kind of a, a key thing that I think Marie was referencing that if you look at uh, your three-year set of data and you look at year one and year three skip year, yeah, there's a high relationship between those two things, but you can't use pre-pandemic data to model a post-pandemic effect or a mid-pandemic effect. So I think that one corollary that's worth thinking about um, is the interim assessment providers. They have the capacity to look at skip time performance. So that if you think about the time being like fall, winter, spring administrations, there's been some examinations of winter to fall or spring to fall which is a good corollary to uncover how we can think about interpreting skip year growth. But all of this has a really key underlying assumption that's really easy to overlook, which is do the, quest the conditions under which the test are administered match the conditions under which the test was designed. And I think that's some of the, the tension that, that Marie and Rob were alluding to a little bit. I think one of the key things is we need to plan our data examinations really carefully to first figure out whether scores have credibility which will then allow us to support examinations um, of deflection from normal. Um, so, and, and uh, I'm gonna do my best to also kind of answer some of the Q and A on the fly while other people are answering other questions. So hopefully that rounded out some of the, the other states perspective. But I think just to reiterate, um, it, is a, it is a series of unknowns, but there's a lot of conversations that are happening across states to share basically strategies and evaluation plans 
to think about how to quickly examine whether you have a fully representative set of data with early return samples. And then once you do, how much confidence do we have in the data that we can actually use this for skip your analyses? Thank you, uh, Juan. And so in this next um, um, round of questions that I wanna ask you, it's gonna deal with both like the limited limitations and challenges, and you've hit on some of that, uh, all three of you. I do want to say, as I look across some of the questions, a lot of the limitation and challenges questions are related to accountability, use of the data. And so it would be great if you can uh, weave in some of that. I mean, I think we'll get to Q and A, but just in case so that you have time. So Marie, I'm gonna come to you first. And you know, how can states navigate the limitations of skip year data use? You, you touched on it a little bit, but can you elaborate on a lot a little? Thank you. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think at this point, we don't quite know yet. I think that's part of the challenge is we're trying to figure out how we actually navigate some of these limitations. Um, and I think that there are also, at least from my personal experience, there have been some limitations that I was not anticipating. So, you know, we had convened a group of our a big group of our stakeholders and really sort of had those conversations about. What should happen for spring testing? You know, what should happen for fall? Next fall's accountability, um, and and what I got back was actually that there is a lot of fear amongst you know our district and school stakeholders around these data being used and misinterpreted and sort of demonizing you know teachers and schools for the impacts of the pandemic and you know having to navigate these extraordinarily difficult teaching conditions where, you know, one day you're remote, the next day you're hybrid, the next day, you know, you're in person and it's constantly changing. Um, and that there's been so little transition time, you know, for people to actually figure out, but how do we actually provide remote instruction to students who didn't sign up for an online program? Like, you know, and again, how do we transition um, uh, in, sometimes in a matter of days between those different um, teaching methodologies? And so, um, you know, our stakeholders really had expressed a lot of concern around, you know, are they going to be sort of scapegoated for the outcomes that we see for our students? And that has made, um, you know, a lot, of our, a lot of our districts really wary of taking these assessments. And so I've spent a lot of my time, you know, really trying to emphasize that um, I, would never, I would never want to do anything that could be misrepresented as saying that somehow teachers have done a bad job of navigating this. Everyone has done the best that they possibly can in an impossible situation. Um, and I would probably say that, and even though I sort of, you know, like I oversee accountability in Colorado, I would say big A accountability is not the way to go. Like I do not want to sort of blame and shame schools and districts and teachers for, you know, again, doing the best that they can in this situation. But I do think there is value in seeing where students are at right now. Um, and especially at the systems level, like a lot of our districts have been, you know, continuing as best they can to do all their local assessments, um, you know, and to uh, gauge where kids are at. I think the challenge is, you know, and that's great for sort of those instructional purposes, but sometimes it doesn't provide, you know, sort of the public or the state an indication of, well, are there some schools or some systems that are struggling more than others? And you know, can we provide them some kind of assistance that will help their students during this time? Um, and so just any information that we can continue to gather around you know, what has been happening with our kids and how can we use it in a productive and not punitive fashion is, is kind of like what I'm really pine or, or what I'm really hoping for um, and really you know, trying to encourage. I think it's challenging, you know, again, because accountability inevitably feels punitive um, and that's kind of how it's been set up. But um, I do think that there are, are definitely ways that we can try to position ourselves, especially, you know, we working at state departments and as accountability folk, um, you know, to make it so that it's not as scary. And it's again, more about support and providing opportunities and helping people because we know that in, like, in the end, we all care about the kids. We all want to give them the best opportunities that are possible, again, in really challenging circumstances. And so I think that has been like the most unexpected um, challenge that I've been trying to navigate is kind of this, this extreme emotional response and this fear that people are really having right now. Um, but I think sort of in a, in a more generalized sense, um, you know, we also always have challenges, you know, anytime there are, you know, these sort of assessment transitions in 
how we, and we don't know what's going to happen until we actually get the data. And you know, both you know, Rob and Juan had said like this is this is the challenge of we're all waiting to see what happens in spring 2021. And you know, the data might be usable, or they might be so profoundly different from what we have seen in the past that all of our previous sort of methodologies and the, you know the inferences that we normally make are not appropriate, and we just don't know yet. Um, and so again, like I mentioned that like we've, we've tried to do all of our due diligence to do like all the background work that we possibly can to prepare ourselves, but it is going to just come down to, we have to see what data we get, if any, in the spring, um, and you know what that actually looks like. Um, and I had seen there was a couple of, you know, um, people in the, in the questions who were asking about, you know, particularly vulnerable subgroups. Um, and that has been something that I have been so worried about this entire this entire pandemic um, and thinking about, you know, all of the, the kids who have parents who are able to sort of, you know, help provide um, or, or bridge the services with that learning when they're doing it remotely. And then the students whose parents really can't, you know, help that, who really are so dependent upon their teachers. Um, and if they don't have the opportunity for that classroom interaction, you know, what is that going to mean for them and, and their results? And how do we actually measure what's been happening to those students. And, and, and for me, again, it's, it's, I don't want it to be about, you know, blaming or shaming or saying that kids have, you know, failed or anything like this. This is about like, we have to know where kids are at post pandemic or during the pandemic. So we can figure out how we can effectively teach them. Like this is again about meeting kids where they're at so that we can really, um, you know, look to improve their situations. And, you know, for our, um, socioeconomically disadvantaged students and our English learners, um, and you know, particularly our students with disabilities, you know, they don't necessarily have the same privileges in, in their homes and the same um, ability to, their parents, I should say, don't have the same ability to, to make up for what they're missing in school. And so I have a lot of concerns about what those results are gonna look like, but it's also very hard because, again, we don't have any data yet, at least at the state level, I don't. Um, and then also those have tended to be anecdotally I've heard the students who aren't testing or who aren't be aren't present in the classroom and then so we're, we're potentially losing out on data for our most impacted populations in a way that I am extremely worried about and trying to figure out like how you know what other pieces of data can be used for these students to ensure that they still get the services that they need um, in order to be able to actually like make educational progress during this time. Wow, thank you. You packed a lot in that. I appreciate the call out of the actual real fears, right, of, 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 of teachers being blamed and schools being unfairly or, or inaccurately even uh, labeled. And so my experience is at the district level uh, and, and certainly, you know, that's our crowd to the state. Like you have all of these requirements and you're not understanding how it's showing up uh, in the district. So thank you for calling out that and especially the inequities, right, because students come in different places, even when we're in person. And so that was that was great. And so so Rob, she kind of hit on some of the things that's also coming up in the chat, but it's around the validity and comparability or lack thereof of, of, of data. And I think you were going to touch on some, some research that has uh, been instructive for Massachusetts on those things and, and the use of it. And if there's time, like what, who do you think should also be engaged? Like what partners at the, at the state are you looking at to, to be part of this work? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think, you know, our proximity, really, where we are in Massachusetts, right? Uh, we have a ton of research partners that um, have, you know, have had a field day with our data over the years. Um, and, you know, given the fact that what we've set ourselves up to, and, and Donna just asked a question about this in the chat, you know, we've really set ourselves up for a, a um, sort of a, a researcher's uh, dream in terms of the way with the data we're going to have this year. Because, I mean, we have data on um, the student's learning model, whether that be remote, hybrid, or um, uh, in person, full in person, we're going to have their test results. We're going to have other um, COVID-related data, and and I really think we've set ourselves up um, for 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 some really interesting information to come out of here, and for researchers to be able to really help us um, moving forward. Although I do think, though, that we have to be careful about what past research has told us about our systems, because it's now impacted by a global pandemic that. Um, you know, as Juan said, it's tough to, 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 to necessarily make the, the correct inferences. Um, if I could touch on for a second um, about the um, 
you know, sort of about the limitations um, of, of, of the data and a lot of the questions that are coming in here. Um, you know, well, I need to be clear that nothing is final um, and we haven't necessarily made our, our, our full decisions on this. You know, my personal opinion is that I can't think of a less important time to publish um, all of this data, right? I don't, I cannot imagine a scenario where we wouldn't want to know and publish the data that we have. I can't think of a more important time to do it. I really can't. Um, and, but at the same time, um, you know, and this is not my typical MO, but I cannot think of a worse time to be focused on big A accountability and to place a label on a school. Um, and I say that as a parent of elementary school students, um, as a um, somebody that's been designing accountability systems for the better part of 20 years, um, I, I can't imagine doing that. Now, we might be forced to through various federal, state, you name it, whatever, and we'll do it. But the value here is in, in the information and what has happened. And, um, and let me just like, the way I've kind of had to put this in context for people is, is if we don't publish data this year, if we don't assess students, if we don't have information, we will go at least in Massachusetts from September of 2019 till September of 2022, assuming we have assessments next year, without putting out any data about what's happened in our districts and schools on a statewide basis, okay? That's an unfathomable thing, um, both as, a, as somebody working at a state education agency and as a parent for me to, to think about in terms of access to information. Um, you know, and as far as partners, um, it's extremely important, right? The fact that we're even having this today illustrates that there's some skepticism about using this data for growth, right? We wouldn't be here today if, there, if everyone agreed upon it, okay? And if everyone thought it was a no-brainer, we wouldn't be sitting here talking today. And I think there are people out there that have skepticism about any data from this year, right? So that there's, it, it exists. So what that does is it means we need to communicate more than ever, okay? And probably when we think we've communicated enough, we probably need to do it some more. And, um, and, and specifically around growth, it's a really interesting thing, right? Because the growth data itself is not going to look any different, right? Kids are still going to be either, somebody's going to be in the first percentile and somebody's going to be in the 99th percentile. And when you take, when you do aggregations, you know, I mean, the, the, the means that in Massachusetts we use means, they're going to be between one and 99, just like they always have been, right? So it's not necessarily going to tell the public on its face what has happened, right? But that's going to be against the backdrop of what many predict, predict to be a sharp decline in achievement data. So we're going to have to really completely um, go back and think about how we talk about the data this year relative to past years. Um, because as much as I've sort of harped on the importance of putting out this data, if we just put it out and allow people to draw their own conclusions from what it say without at least attempting to try to add some context around it and what it means to skip a year, and the conclusions that can be drawn from there and how it relates to achievement data, you know, that's as big as failure in my mind as, as, as not putting out the data. So, um, you know, and I'll continue to answer the questions in the chat as best I can, uh, Tamika, but I hope that was, that was helpful in that regard. Yes, it was. And you all are fantastic with answering some of the questions I've tried to keep up. And so you're doing a really great job of weaving it in. And so uh, Juan, still on this theme of limitations and challenges, and I think you've answered some, uh, addressed it similar uh, in, in the chat as well. But what should states be considering, right, if they're thinking about use of, of skip your data, both, you know, on the, you know, hesitation, but also, you know, the uh, why they should and really thinking about communications, I kind of hint it to what districts should know and, and should be doing and, and the connection with the state. So help us out, what should they be considering as, as they move forward in this decision? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very small question, right? Um, the, uh, I think the interpretation is probably paramount here and thinking about all of the assumptions associated with interpretation. Um, I think as noted previously, and, and this is something I think that I, I try to say regularly because I think it's something we can't forget, is that it's impossible to model a post-pandemic effect using pre-pandemic data. Um, the one pager that's referenced in the, um, in the chat box talked about the role of sample size. I think in some of the questions have popped up. I think more importantly is probably the role of data missingness and non-random data missingness. Um, so do we have sufficiently representative data 
uh, in terms of not just demographics and subgroups, but actually also performance bands. Uh, one way to think about that is through deciles of performance. Something that Marie was talking about is, and I've, I've been toying around looking at some of the, the models and it looks like, um, and I think this goes back to some of the multi-level literature, a couple of people have actually raised this in the Q&A, is that above 70%, you probably have a decent amount of generalizations that you can make. But if you are starting to hit some non-random missingness, and this is where that 95% threshold comes in, is because of like the systemic loss of underperforming students. Um, I, earlier I referenced a couple of the interim assessment providers that have access to some of these data that they looked at from like fall to winter or fall to spring. And even they have noted that the biggest challenge they have is with missing of, of uh, historically underserved students or underrepresented students. And so even their best estimates of what they're seeing in their results from what happened last year to this year are that um, it doesn't look so bad in some cases, like reading doesn't look so bad, math looks pretty bad, but we're missing a whole bunch of kids. So, and the kids that we're missing are the ones that are usually the worst performing. So it's actually probably looking a lot worse than we think it is. Um, so I think that the, the notion of it being sufficiently representative, both in demographics and in performance and digging deeply into individual school site comparisons to basically go from like the sample to the population of the school. And then if you're at a district level to think about, do you have a fully representative set at the school is hyper important to understand whether you can make any generalizations about actual acquisition of student content. Um, this is really not the year. Um, well, let me actually back up for a second. I think the focus should probably be on obtaining the information, um, if practicable, safe, and defensible to administer the assessment, because I think that's the big question right now, but to be very, very judicious to how to use it. Large-scale assessment accountability is rife with misuse, and if you don't attach a label to it, it can quickly be used for public shaming, naming and shaming. And I think that's one thing that we're all really hesitant to do this year. Um, this is not the year to continue to overextend our assumptions around large-scale assessment. And that's the vehicle to inform instructional strategies or the next specific steps to help students catch up during the pandemic. That's the realm of curriculum embedded assessments and the educator's formative assessment practices. But this is the year, however, to leverage the intended use, if you can get it, of large-scale assessment and the potential of skip your growth as a means to corroborate system level needs. A lot of the, the answers that I've added in there are about really recognizing the limitation in the role of large-scale summative. Um, and, and what you're thinking about is what's the school, the student, the group, the district or regional level inf uh, inferences that you can make? And do you have enough information? Again, it doesn't have to be that you tested all the kids. Is did you have, did you test enough of the kids that are, that allow you to generalize? That can help identify opportunities for delivering services, helping schools partner up or share strategies or even pool their thinking to tackle some of these common challenges. Um, I, I'll, I'll just finish this statement with, if, if large scale assessments blown up this year, that's not to say that there's like, we have nothing that we can work with. Um, there are a lot of districts, a lot of schools that have, whether they're school-wide assessments or even uh, interim level assessments that, that are available. But I think you have to be really clear about what actions can you make using that information, those information defensively and don't overextend those things in the same way that we've probably inappropriately overextended the use of large scale summative in the past. Overpromising on that has really kind of caused some challenges today. Um, and I think that we're at great risk of using things like um, uh, mid cycle or short cycle assessments to try to shoehorn them there in place of summative assessment. And that is not what they were designed to do. Thank you. And so as I, you know, again, I go through the Q&A and again, thank you all for who've been able to go into the chat and answer. As I try to like sum them up, like there are very degrees of, 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 you know, specificity around the questions, but I can still think I can sum it up. I'm going to ask like two questions and then give each of you the remaining three or four minutes to respond to that and then we'll close out. And to the participants, attendees, thank you. Is my 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 assumption that we, we're addressing what you asked, but I think we have access to your information and we can share more. But you know, so one kind of basic question, you know, what if we don't have data for 2021? Like there's an assumption that, oh, 2020 is gone, but we got data for this year. So how does skip your data work if the 2021 data is incomplete? But it's also just an extension of the other conversation around accountability and, you know, like what kind of 
advice. People are asking about, you know, there's still the digital divide. There's these inequity issues that, you know, that this is assuming that all the students this year were going to school at the same time in the same setting. Some districts had hybrid, some people had, you know, all in learning, some all remote. How are you or what questions are you asking to navigate those things? So we'll skip your data work if 2021 data is incomplete. And what's the real ways that you're navigating all the various things that this pandemic uh, has caused uh, on us? So I'll come to, how about we go Rob, Juan, Marie, and then Cheryl, I'll turn it back over to you after these wrap up questions. Yeah, so, you know, it's, 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 I mean, the understatement is that it's been a really interesting year, right? Um, in that one of the challenges is we are accumulating a wealth of information that we've never had access to before about our students, right? But the challenge is we're also at the same time, you know, in some ways serving as the largest firefighting agency in the state, right? In other words, that we're fighting the day's fires and, and, and not, um, while at the same time trying to keep an eye on what's coming uh, ahead, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to, to work those balances. Um, if we don't have 2021 assessments, um, you know, I think we are in a position where we're going to really need to rethink sort of, um, I, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say that we are, it will derail, you know, our assessment and accountability systems, but we might be looking at sort of a reestablishment of a baseline or, you know, and with, with the next time and not trying to string something along. But I don't know, I mean, maybe there are um, particular, you know, maybe we'll be able to pull some magic and, and, and make that work. But I think we need to really assess things if we're talking about uh, going without data for a, a second consecutive year. I think um, the other the other piece that is critical here is um, we're going to need to think about what questions we answer for the public in a much different way than we ever have before, right? I think we kind of got into a nice little rhythm of what questions we answer on a regular basis, right? Subgroups, achievement, growth, relationship, you know, um, you know, maybe looking at mobility, different things like that. We, we had sort of gotten comfortable. Um, that comfort is gone. And um, we need to think about what are the real questions that we need to be looking at here um, with an equity lens. Um, and that equity lens is not just in different ways that we've looked at in the past, whether that be economic disability versus not and, and, and whatnot, but kids have experienced much different things this year than they ever have in the past. Um, and that needs to be, we need, we can't, you know, get by 2021 and say, well, that was just a 2021 thing. And now we're good to go and keep going wherever we've been wanting to go. Um, these, this year is going to stick with us for a while. Um, and we need to make sure that we are prepared in the data that we're collecting now and maybe continuing to collect um, to make sure that we have a full understanding of what's happened with our kids in a lot of different areas. Thank you, Juan. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, so no 2021 data. Um, so I actually think that what this year has done for rethinking accountability is something that should have happened under the reauthorization of ESEA uh, in 20, let's call it 2012, when it was first really starting to crystallize. Um, I think that the challenge that we face is one, and this was raised in the Q&A, about the difference between stability and volatility. Um, and large-scale assessment, large-scale accountability decisions, things that are really consequential, high stakes in nature, rely on stable data. And while we are trying to in, like, implement interventions that are intended to improve the capacity and behaviors of people in districts and schools, um, those, the metrics that we have for high stakes accountability are not designed to shift quickly uh, year over year. They're, they're a slow moving ship um, and we rely on a lot of stability in the information. So if we lose 2021, I think to Rob's point, it is time to probably think about, do we need to reset baselines? Do we need to, can we really stretch back so far as to say, let's, let's look back two years. Um, but what I think that would might, might be a more uh, productive use of our time would actually be thinking about the missing information that we currently need for within year accountability that would supplement our existing large scale accountability efforts. Not to say that there, that it replaces one because the two things are, are supplementary to a degree. And these are things that should be happening at the little a accountability level that Marie was talking about at the district that are district focused 
but the role of potentially the state could be to support districts to engage in kind of systematic support to be able to facilitate reporting that happens among districts, among schools, and to maybe model um, internal evaluation processes that happen from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year to the end of the year that look at much more granular information that are actually coherently linked to large-scale summative assessment, large-scale accountability. Um, save the large-scale accountability for the high stakes consequences, but then create these models that can be used to inform kind of district, um, uh, district inquiry about data that are available, um, that some things the state collects that can be used to kind of highlight differences across districts, differences across schools, and kind of help connect schools with one another. Um, but then also think about the, um, potentially it, it looks like changing the way that we think about assessment requirements in general, um, which I know is a conversation that's ongoing with some of the, the multi-state groups and with Council for Chief State School Officers and what that happens with your authorization of us under the next round. Um, so I think that there's, there are reaction questions that we can be thinking about immediately that how do we then kind of pivot to make sure that we're identifying the schools that really need support. But then there are probably more strategic questions that we'd be asking ourselves to think through how do we also then corroborate that we know that we're providing um, support within the year to the schools that need it that correspond with the high, the more higher level course grain interventions that we use from large scale summative. Thank you, Marie. I mean, I can just sort of, you know, um, reiterate what Edward has said, you know, in terms of this is not a year for big A accountability. And again, for sort of the, you know, the blaming and shaming, I think that, um, we all recognize that that is not um, that is not appropriate given the circumstances that we find ourselves under, and so you know uh, a lot of good ideas around you know looking at alternate sources of data. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have had in Colorado is um, is that we don't have a state student information system. We are a local control state, so uh, you know all the districts have local assessments that they're giving to their students, and so they have more information honestly than the state does. And so, you know, we really are trusting in them and in their expertise and ability to provide the appropriate instructional decisions for students, like as we're going through, um, you know, the school year. And then potentially, you know, I think we're not sure how the if and how the state is going to get any information on how students are doing sort of at that systems level. Um, and maybe, you know, again, because those are, you know, intended to be interim and formative assessments, it's not appropriate for us to be sort of trying to make any of these you know, big evaluative judgments about how they're doing. And potentially at the state level, at least for us, I feel like that's just kind of an acknowledging that and recognizing that there is this limitation that is happening for this year. And we might not have as much um, data as we wanted. Um, I think in Colorado, we're probably gonna be looking to Massachusetts and some of the other states that really do have more robust you know, um, data collection systems and are getting all this information specific to the pandemic and, and looking for, you know, some guidance on, on what we should be doing next. Um, and so in some places, I would say that, you know, Colorado is in an interesting situation where, where um, we don't necessarily have the ability or the capacity to, to get data ourselves. Um, and so how do we engage in, in more meaningful dialogues, particularly with our, you know, our districts and our stakeholders to get an idea of what is happening with them um, without us actually like being like, we don't have any data you know, to say, this is how you're doing. And so we've um, spent a lot of time, um, so Colorado is one of the few states for our state system that we have sort of a request to reconsider process. Even in normal years, we allow districts to potentially submit um, supplemental data to our state frameworks. Um, to then make the argument potentially about, you know, that they're actually doing doing better. And so, you know, we're really having a lot of conversations about what could that look like in the current circumstances? Because again, if we don't actually have state data, what information could be provided by schools and districts that, you know, would potentially be appropriate um, or, you know, useful for the kind of accountability decisions or like we have an accountability clock, you know, taking people off the clock. And we've also been really looking at um, you know, and not just looking at data, but actually like um, we have a state review panel and they do sort of, you know, this very in-depth review process and they figure out how to, you know, go online and actually 
participate in online classes and still sort of make recommendations about the quality of the schools and how they're teaching. And so I think we're really looking to um, you know, expand that universe of data that we're willing to consider during this awkward transition time. And I think depending on if we don't have data in the spring, I think that really will just push that to the next sort of level of importance where we're you know, really going to be considering alternative information. But I will say it's also, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation to, to navigate, um, you know, so that so that because we do see that there is value in those state assessments and in having consistent data across all of our students. It's just in this current circumstance that that's not available to us. So we're looking for alternatives. Well, thank you. Oh, go ahead, Rob. You got us. I'm just going to add one thing that I, I wanted to mention. I just forgot. I apologize. But um, you know, one of the things that I think is really important for my state colleagues out there and that I've talked to a lot about them, I believe that we have a collective responsibility that if there are assessments this year that around timing, and that is we need to turn around this data as state education agencies as quickly as we possibly can so that districts can use districts and schools can use that data to inform programmatic decisions for, for kids going into next year. I think we have a well-honed tradition of you know, sort of dissecting the mosquito and making sure that everything is perfect before, before we release any data. Um, and um, and, and we, we, I think we really need to make sure that um, we think about it differently um, and, and, and think about that this is for, you know, the diagnostic purposes that this data, these data should be used for in, in getting ready for um, next school year, if, if, if that comes to be. Yes, thank you, Rob, for that. And that, that kind of goes in, in, in hand with, um, a couple of the comments, including one around one you raised the issue around communications. And so um, what I'd say, again, just as a former district level person with the state, just communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, one of the things I know we did in Tennessee when we were having these issues is that our governors, then Governor Bredesen, like we actually went to all parts of the state to communicate. We're changing our standards. This was about standards changing. And we knew that schools that looked like they were high performing were not getting ready to show high performance. And that helped because the messaging, we took care of the messaging on the front end. It helped from a community panic uh, perspective. And so the more we can talk to our teachers and our practitioners and everything, we know that um, that will be uh, grateful. Panelists, uh, thank you again for sharing both your, your thoughts and your fears, your vulnerability. We appreciate that. That was real. And so people on the call is not leaving thinking like, oh, these people got it figured out. You know, they understand. But you shared a lot about what you do know. And that was helpful to our to our attendees, we know that we could be having this uh, eight, eight hour conversation. There's a lot more we could have covered. We just couldn't get to. And if you had questions that we didn't get to, sure, like I, I'll leave to you to say, I think we're going to try to make sure we get to them. But thank you all, Cheryl and Jen, DQC and Hunt Institute. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Cheryl, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, and thank you uh, to the data quality data quality campaign, our partners, uh, and to our wonderful panelists and moderators. I have never seen panelists work so hard to answer all the questions that came up in the chat. Um, so hopefully you're leaving feeling you have some answers to these very challenging questions you know, that we have going on right now. Um, and I have put up a slide to for you so you can all see that we do have the second webinar in this series coming up February 25th. My colleague has just put the registration link in the chat. So if we didn't get to your questions today, uh, maybe we can get to them in the second. The second one is about policymaker insights on skip year growth um, with Representative Ashton Clemens from North Carolina, Representative Harold Love Jr. from Tennessee and Delegate Kerry Coiner from Virginia. Uh, so they will offer a very interesting perspective on this topic as well. And please visit our website for a growing list of webinars in the new year, um, including one on Thursday, focused on community activism and coalition building for educational equity in our race and education series. And once again, thank you to our panelists, our moderator and our partners and to all participants. This has been a great interactive discussion even though we are not in person. So please stay well and enjoy the rest of your day.